Good morning. I hope I hope you can all hear me. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, albeit only virtually, at this uh, wonderfully organised and marvellous conference. Can I begin by thanking Georgina for the invitation and together with Nina and Basil for the organisation of this wonderful conference. Um, and at a conference that looks back on the shaping of our nation, can I also express my respect for the Indigenous people on whose land we meet, uh, physically and virtually, and to their past and present communities and elders. In 1954, Sir Robert Menzies, then Prime Minister, said this, did anyone suppose that a man like myself who loves the law and the practice of the law and the whole philosophy of the law would go into this turbulent stream for a job? A job, of course not. Years later, shortly after his retirement from politics, he said that politics proved to be my greatest duty, but the law remained my first love. Despite Menzies' extraordinary contributions to the law as author, barrister, Attorney General for the State of Victoria, Attorney General for the Commonwealth, his departure from the law as a full-time profession for politics um, when he was in his mid-30s meant that his exceptional legal abilities were never fully developed. So in a sense, this presentation is something of a sliding doors focus. In examining the contributions that Menzies made to the law, the obvious comparison is with another man whose extraordinary legal contributions were made during a career that intersected throughout many times with that of Menzies. Um, that other man was perhaps Australia's greatest ever lawyer and Menzies' mentor, Sir Owen Dixon. Ultimately, as Prime Minister, Menzies offered Dixon the position as Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, saying that although this offer was usually made by the Attorney General, Menzies could not resist doing so personally. And when Dixon retired as Chief Justice of the High Court, Barwick, his replacement, speculated that the only two people who satisfied the requirements for the appointment were himself, that is Barwick, and Menzies. But Menzies, who by then was about to turn 70 and would soon retire, had no interest in the position. He wrote to his daughter that he had no ambition to knock off work to carry bricks. So Garfield Barwick, who was appointed then to succeed Dixon as Chief Justice, to the great dismay of Dixon, I should add, nevertheless speculated that Menzies might have preferred the office of Chief Justice to that of Prime Minister. Menzies himself remarked that he envied Barwick's appointment, adding that, if I had been in his place, still remaining with my old passions for the law, I would have said, yes, I would like to go to the High Court. I'm sure I would have. In this short presentation, I'll skip briefly over Menzies' early impetuses towards the law, which Troy has touched upon wonderfully. It suffices to say that he finished at the top of his law school at the University of Melbourne. Um, he graduated with a master's degree and a swathe of academic awards, including the Bowen Prize for an essay entitled The Rule of Law During the War, which I'll come back to at the end of this presentation. At the time of Menzies' graduation, the Law School of the University of Melbourne was under the deanship of the brilliant constitutional lawyer, Professor Harrison Moore. Menzies was taught by Harrison Moore and colourfully said that whatever is right in my knowledge of constitutional law is derived from him. Around a decade earlier, Harrison Moore had taught another student who was equally glowing of Harrison Moore. That other student was Owen Dixon. And as I've said, the careers of Menzies and Dixon were then very closely intertwined. After Menzies was admitted to the bar in 1918, only 155th on the role of counsel, he was the first of only three pupils taken by Dixon in the latter's time at the bar. As Dixon's pupil, Menzies described himself as entering a new world of logic and thought and losing any self-conceit which may have been induced by my success as a student. Menzies was entranced by Dixon's intellect. At Dixon's retirement, he described Dixon as the greatest legal advocate I saw either here or abroad. He described an occasion when his wife had expressed doubt as to some opinion Menzies had offered, to which Menzies replied, well, Dixon thinks so, and that's good enough for me. Menzies then described the exchange that followed. Bob, his wife said, I think you ought to realise that Dixon is not God to which he replied, you're quite right, my dear, but only just. Menzies' very early years saw him appear many times in the County Court of Victoria, where he greatly enjoyed the informality. 
But it wasn't long before his appearances were heavily sought after in cases both before the Supreme Court of Victoria and the High Court of Australia. Indeed, his first appearance in the High Court was in September 1918, just four months after admission to the bar at the age of 23. He appeared as then as pupil and junior counsel to Dixon. By the time Menzies was in his late 20s, he was appearing numerous times every year in the High Court in cases ranging from constitutional law to income tax law. Many of these appearances were again with Dixon. Like Dixon, Menzies worked extremely hard, often long into the night. He estimated that he averaged at least 80 hours of work a week. As was observed in Parliament many years later, by 1929, when at the age of 34, Menzies became Australia's youngest King's Counsel, he was already an outstanding constitutional lawyer who had very few rivals. Menzies' technical excellence, excellence and appreciation of the law were skills that he'd honed on a foundation of pragmatism. He attached significance to the relationship between law and life. To his mind, and I quote, the law should constantly be seen against a human background. He viewed the law as a social construct, which, as he expressed it, needs to continually develop to benefit the growing needs of a growing community. He disapproved of the law being perceived as something that was desiccated and detached or unrelated to the lives of human beings. In this respect, Menzies' approach to the law contrasted with the formal logic of Dixon. Perhaps this was the reason that Menzies and Dixon as a council team were so formidable. Dixon had been steeped in classical learning and doctrine. Dixon's 1923 diaries reveal that his reading was classic and, classical Greek and Latin literature when it was off the bench. And later on the bench of the High Court, Dixon would cheekily pass notes to Fulliger in Greek, um, and he passed them over Williams, who was not a Greek scholar and was a little frustrated by this. By contrast, Menzies, who'd struggled with Latin at school, was not an enthusiastic classicist, but he had outstanding judgment, a powerful feel for the case, and an appreciation in his words of there being a world of difference between academic learning and the same learning when, when applied to the tangled facts of life. Menzies had a strong grasp of the secret of advocacy, which was connecting with people. Again, this contrasted with Dixon. Despite Dixon's brilliant mind and formal logic, he didn't always connect with people. As Menzies said of Dixon, I did not ever think him to be quite at home addressing a jury. He found difficulty getting on the same wavelength. Menzies' first appearance in the High Court was at the age of 24 in Troy and Wigglesworth. Um, that was his first appearance unled. He successfully argued against the conviction of his client on the basis of a lack of uh, jurisdiction of the court in which his client was convicted. Menzies appeared um, with his father, James Menzies, observing from the back of court. It may have been during this appearance <clears throat> that Menzies answered the first question posed by Justice Gavin Duffy in simple terms, yes. Subsequently, in Menzies' words, Justice Gavin Duffy then took him out to see. Menzies said, as I was about to think for the third time, I gave a sickly grin and said, Your Honour, I seem to feel that when I said yes some time ago, I should have said no. Could I now say no and let us start all over again? In the first line of their reasons for decision, Justices Barton, Isaacs and Rich nevertheless wrote, this case has been very ably argued on both sides. And Justice Gavin Duffy in dissent subsequently told Menzies that he had been very much impressed by the ability with which you presented the argument. Menzies' father, who'd been in court, admitted to his wife after observing their son's performance that he had been underestimating Menzies' talents. Some of the arguments made by Menzies in the High Court were on matters on which he had strong personal views, including one area of restrictive interpretations of Commonwealth power. I'll skip over his views in this area to come to the most significant case in his career, where he argued precisely the opposite. Menzies' greatest victory came in a case where he was briefed to argue for a dramatically expanded approach to Commonwealth power. Menzies described himself as having had, at the age of 25, the impertinence to accept a brief before the High Court of Australia. The case in which he accepted the brief was the engineer's case. The decision in that case is one of the most important decisions for the operation of the federal compact that has ever been given by the High Court. The decision and reasons 
uh, handed down on the 31st of August, 1920, only weeks after the court had finished hearing the case, brought Menzies sudden fame as a lawyer. Prior to the engineer's case, the High Court had recognised an implied prohibition in the Constitution against the states and the Commonwealth interfering with various aspects of the functions of each other. This included interference by the Commonwealth with state instrumentalities. But a questionable distinction had been drawn between the trading functions of a state instrumentality, where this doctrine didn't apply, and its governmental functions. The engineer's case was concerned with an industrial dispute submitted to the Commonwealth Court of Conciliation and Arbitration between the amalgamated societies of engineers as claimant and hundreds of respondents, importantly, including some Western Australian government instrumentalities. The essential question was whether the Commonwealth Parliament had power to extend the jurisdiction of the Commonwealth Court of Conciliation and Arbitration to apply to these West Australian government instrumentalities. Menzies saw himself as constrained by the High Court's earlier decisions about implied immunities. So his submission was that the doctrine of immunities did not apply because the West Australian government instrumentalities were engaged in trading activities and not in government activities. What happened in court at the first hearing in Melbourne was colourfully described by Menzies as follows. An hour or so after I had begun developing this argument, doing lip service to the doctrine, Mr Justice Stark, who was a very distinguished common lawyer and whose blunt habits of expression made no exception in favour of a very young man, looked at me in a grumbling way and said, this argument is a lot of nonsense. I, in what I later realised to be an inspired moment, replied, Sir, I quite agree. Well, intervened Chief Justice Knox, never the most genial of interrogators, why are you putting an argument which you admit is nonsense? Because I am compelled by the earlier decisions of this court. If your honours will permit me to question any or all of these earlier decisions, I will undertake to advance a sensible argument. I waited for the heavens to fall. Instead, the Chief Justice said, the court will retire for a few minutes. And when they came back, he said, this case will be adjourned for argument at Sydney. Each government will be notified that it may apply to intervene. Council will be at liberty to challenge any earlier decision of the court. When the hearing resumed in Sydney, Menzies thus challenged the implied immunities doctrine, as well as arguing that the power of the Commonwealth should be construed fully and without regard to the reserved powers of the states. In the result, Menzies' submission was accepted with only Justice Gavin Duffy dissenting. The High Court abandoned both the doctrines of reserved powers and implied immunities. Menzies later said of the engineer's case that it represented the acceptance of the view that the powers of the Commonwealth Parliament are to be intervened, inter interpreted quite fully, comprehensively, subject only to express restrictions contained in the Constitution. The existence of the states was not as a general rule to constitute one of those restrictions. The engineer's case was not without difficulty. In a joint judgment of four members of the court, almost certainly authored primarily by Justice Isaacs, the heart of the reasoning appeared to suggest that the text of the constitution should be interpreted without any implications from matters outside the constitution, including those drawn from the very nature of the federal compact. The decision in the engineer's case had been was trenchantly criticised by some people, although defended by others. Speaking of the decision nearly a century later, Justice Callanan said that to disregard entirely a or perhaps the fundamental policy of the constitution, federalism, and the careful division of power that it involves is to disregard or at least to attach little weight to the object which beyond all doubt the framers intended the people who voted in favour of federation adopted. Dixon particularly disliked the engineer's case. He said that he, many had taken a view of the case that in interpreting the constitution, no implications can be made. Dixon said that such a method of construction would defeat the intention of any instrument, but of all instruments, a written constitution seemed the last to which it could be applied. In subsequent decisions, most notably Melbourne Corporation and the Commonwealth, Dixon and other members of the High Court wound back the approach to the engineer's case. That process has continued, um, including in a 2019 decision of the High Court by a majority of 4-3 in Spence and Queensland, which held that a Commonwealth legislative provision was invalid because it did not have a sufficiently strong connection with federal elections 
and extended to the regulation of that which is within the heartland of state legislative power. The, inro in the inroads into the decision in the engineer's case do not, however, deny the case past and continuing significance in Australian constitutional law. As always, Menzies' view of the engineer's case was to see the legal principle in pragmatic social terms based around his big ideas for how society should be shaped. While describing as revolutionary the method of interpreting Commonwealth powers that the court had approved, he thought that the principles laid down in the case should not be immutable or absolute. He placed the decision within a movement which he described as a strong centralising tendency in relation to power carried on by the rising significance of Australia in world affairs and the obvious need for having a national government which can speak with authority on behalf of the nation. If the engineer's case was Menzies' greatest victory as a legal counsel, then the Communist Party case was perhaps his greatest legal defeat. But it wasn't a defeat that Menzies suffered as counsel. It was a defeat of the legislation that he introduced as prime minister. Once again, it was a circumstance where Menzies' pragmatic and social views of the law as a principle in service of society contrasted with the formalism and logic of his friend and former mentor, Dixon. I won't speak about the uh, background for legislation in this short pre presentation as others will probably deal with it. Suffice to say that in 1950, as prime minister, Menzies said that he held the conviction that Australia must urgently prepare for the possibility of a third world war, saying that if a third world war were to occur, it will be the result of an attack by international communism. Menzies introduced the Communist Party Dissolution Bill 1950 with a preamble that cited the defence power as one of the heads of power principally relied upon, a power which Menzies had described as having proved itself the most flexible and most extensible power ever written into this or any other constitution. The bill passed with the purpose of the security and defence of Australia, and section four of the act declared the Communist Party to be an unlawful association and dissolved by force of the act. Section five of the act empowered the governor general to declare a body affiliated with or connected with the Communist Party to be an unlawful organisation if, in the opinion of the Governor General, the continued existence of that body would be prejudicial to the security or defence of the Commonwealth or the maintenance of the Constitution. That declaration could only be set aside by the prescribed body making an application to the court to which it bore an onus to adduce evidence. The Act was challenged in the High Court by the Communist Party and others. The hearing took 24 days. Garfield Barwick KC, who acted for the defendants and who Menzies would later appoint as Chief Justice to replace Dixon, had nine assisting counsel, including three silks appearing with him. One of the central questions in the case was whether the act could be supported by the defence power in the constitution. The High Court held by a majority of 6-1 with only Chief Justice Latham dissenting that the act was invalid. Every member of the court gave separate reasons for decision. At the heart of the reasons of the Chief Justice in the minority was the conclusion that the defence power includes defence against internal enemies. That is, the defence power extended to protecting the people against internal attack by means of subversive and treasonable activities. By contrast, in his reasoning in the majority, Justice Dixon asserted that the purpose of the defence power was the protection of the Commonwealth only from external enemies. And the validity of the act depended upon the existence of serious armed conflict, including a mounting danger of hostilities before any out actual outbreak of war. Menzies' view, as I've explained, was that Australia faced an existential threat from communism. He'd written that the war brings its own circumstances and its own peculiar necessities. And one of those necessities has been the power in some authority to control the thousand and one minutiae which may produce conducive to military success. But the act had passed when Australia was not strictly at war. Hence, like the other members of the majority, Dixon, Justice Dixon held that in circumstances, including that Australia wasn't at war, the act was invalid. As John Howard wrote, the decision of the High Court was a serious setback for Menzies. In Parliament, four days after the defeat, 
Menzies honed in on the judgment of Justice Dixon, singling out Dixon's reasons and saying, and I quote, this decision discloses grievous limitations upon the powers of Commonwealth Parliament. That it is hard to deny. For as we have repeatedly pointed out in this house, many facts which those responsible for executive government and therefore for the safety of the country know only too well are susceptible of legal proof, or alternatively could be are not susceptible of legal proof, or alternatively could be proved only by the most dangerous disclosure of the personnel and operations of our security service. In later conversations with Dixon, Menzies related that he'd been shocked on reading Dixon's judgment. Dixon had responded by blaming Barwick and saying that Barwick's submissions were dialectic and that Barwick had no general knowledge. Skipping over the failed subsequent referendum and much of the reasoning in the uh, Communist Party case, um, the result in that case, um, the, sorry, the reasoning in that case, although, although not the result, um, was sub has subsequently been eroded by the High Court. A much broader approach uh, to the decision, consistently with some of the views uh, expressed by Menzies, was taken by a majority of the High Court in 2007. In that case, four members of the court held that the purpose of the defence power was not confined to military responses or external attack, and that it extended to protect the Commonwealth generally. In that case, the uh, interim control order regime in the Commonwealth Criminal Code was upheld on the basis of the defence power. And the court said that uh, the defence power extended not just to the protection of the realm from physical attack, but also from attacks that would involve, for example, seriously interfering with electronic systems. The day after the decision, that decision, the Age newspaper summarised the dissenting judgment of Justice Kirby as saying that Australians who accepted the foresight, prudence and wisdom of the Communist Party decision would look back with regret and embarrassment at this latest decision. Nevertheless, the actual result in the Communist Party was rigorously upheld by the High Court. As two members of the majority explained, Menzies' legislation had not been addressed to suppressing violence or disorder and had not taken the course of forbidding descriptions of conduct with objective standards or tests of liability on the subject. This short presentation, um, in conclusion, has sought to give a flavour of Sir Robert Menzies' approach to the law by discussing some of his enormous contributions to the law despite the relative brevity of his legal career as a barrister. Some illustration of his perspectives on the law can be given, as I've said, by considering the overlap uh, between him and the outlook of Sir Owen Dixon. Both men were stunningly effective and successful lawyers, but with very different styles, outlooks and approaches. In many ways, Menzies' approach to the law as principle shaped by pragmatism may also have contributed to him being such a successful politician. As Senator Withers said in Parliament upon a motion of condolence following Menzies' death, for Menzies, law and civilization we're inseparably bound together. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Um, and uh, thank you for delivering our first online uh, presentation. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, I actually have so many questions, such a fascinating presentation, um, but, uh, Menzies was obviously a, a fantastic advocate, a great orator. Um, how important, in your view, was um, Menzies' advocacy skills over his legal argument, or were they both equally important? Well, I've read um, dozens of the uh, summarised transcripts um, in the Commonwealth Law Reports of arguments that Menzies made. Um, in the High Court of Australia, and there are many, many occasions in which he appeared. Um, the strong flavour of the decisions in light of those arguments is that his, his advocacy was enormously important. Mm. Um, and in many ways, um, as I said earlier, his, his advocacy and his advocacy skills complemented Owen Dixon's, who's probably regarded, certainly at the time was regarded as Australia's greatest legal advocate. And they complemented Dixon's skills because I think they probably took 
a lot of the hard, rigorous, logical edge of, the, of Dixon's arguments and tailored the arguments, Menzies tailored his approaches very much to um, the views of the court and would, would follow and flow uh, with the personalities on the court. Um, the extract of the exchanges in the engineer's case that I quoted from uh, Menzies himself, I think is a really good example of him being able to read and understand the personalities on the court. Um, in that case, for example, he um, one of the reasons, no doubt, that Menzies put his submission in the way he did and accepted straight away that the arguments that he was making were nonsense um, and asked for the opportunity to reopen earlier decisions of the High Court, was he would have known that at least two members of that court was staunchly opposed, um, that's Isaacs and Higgins, staunchly opposed to the earlier restrictive approaches, um, including um, the implied immunities doctrine. So although he didn't say that um, in his summaries, Menzies' advocacy was, I think, without doubt tailored to the various personalities on the court. And I think he would have had a very strong sense that they would have been very likely to um, to, to follow him um, where you know, he was inviting them to give him permission to reopen the earlier decisions. So the, the, short, the short answer to your, your question is, I think his advocacy was enormously effective and part of it was the fact that his, it was his understanding of people and personalities. Yeah, thank you, uh, Troy. Thanks. Uh, Justice Edelman, Troy Bramston. Um, asking you this question. Um, in your study, in your, in your reading, um, I wanted to ask you about Doc Evett uh, and see whether you had any reflections on the Menzies-Evett relationship, given that they both faced each other in the courtroom and of course in parliament and Menzies had a good relationship with uh, John Curt and Ben Chifley and uh, Arthur Corwell, but he really disliked Evett. And if you could just sort of compare and compa contrast and reflect on their relationship. Um, yeah. it's. I I mean, I've, I've read um, biographies of obviously Menzies and um, and Evert, and there's a lot that's been said about um, about the enmity between uh, the two of them. Um, part, I think I think part of it was their um, different political outlooks. Um, a lot of it also may be um, from the legal perspective, the very different approaches that um, they both took to the law. Um, Menzies was, I think very much shaped by um, Dixon's approach to the law. Um, he, he saw, although Menzies saw law as um, principle shaped by pragmatism, um, at, the, at the core of his approach was sort of the, the, the Dixonian logic um, to the law. Whereas um, Evert's approach um, to the law tend to be very much um, a top-down, uh, much more of a top-down approach where um, he, Evert would start from a social um, construction and a, and, a, and a social ideal, and, um, and that would lead him very often to a conclusion of, about outcome. Um, they had, they, uh, they, both as counsel um, and as lawyers, I think they had those different approaches, they had different ideological outlooks, and also, um, as you'll be very well aware, very different personalities. So, I think perhaps all of that shaped the, uh, the, the difficulties that they had in their relations with each other. William. Yeah. Yeah, William Coleman, the ANU. You've spoken very interestingly about Menzies uh, connection with association with Dixon and with Evett. Menzies wrote the foreword to John Reynolds' biography of Edmund Barton. And in that foreword, he records how as a young barrister at a formal occasion, he was invited to propose the toast in honour of the, you know, the, the Justice, Justice Barton. Reading this, I was left wondering, is there anything more to it between Menzies and Barton, or is that just about it? Um, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I, I've read very little about the relationship um, between uh, Menzies and Barton and um, the, any of the views that Menzies had um, on Barton's, certainly on Barton's, certainly on Barton's writing as a, as a, as a judge. Um, there's, 
there's yeah there's not there's not much I can add to that. If, um, I mean if you if you have any perspectives, I'd be very happy to hear them. One more. Um, Judge, I do have um, a question about the, the Communist Party dissolution bill. Um, it's, it's often a critique um, by politicians, I guess, that, that judges can be activists and obviously interfere in their, in their in political decisions and, and government decisions. Um, and Menzies expressed some of those views on the, on the floor of parliament as you, as you articulated. Um, was that court of Owen Dixon at the time known for being particularly activist or was this just a natural reaction of a prime minister who didn't get his way well it's that's that, i mean that's a great question because um in, in a way the the, fla the flavor of some of robert menzies remarks in parliament was that you know that, that, that this decision was um a very unpragmatic decision that it didn't fit with society but menzies did also recognize that the decision was one which was given in a very formal and legalistic manner. And that's partly why I think he admired Dixon so much. Um, there, there, whatever tension there might have been between him and Dixon as a result of the decision, he nevertheless still very shortly thereafter appointed Dixon as Chief Justice um, of the High Court and made glowing remarks um, on his appointment um, of Dixon at the High Court and Dixon um, correspondingly in a speech on that occasion, very famously said that the role of the court is strict and complete legalism, um, which I think Menzies would have appreciated and would have understood that um, although sometimes the, the expression activism might be used to sort of characterise a decision that just doesn't fit with the political flavour of the moment, um, Dixon's approach, it was legalistic in the sense of formal, complete logic, uh, despite uh, whatever pragmatic views might be taken of the result. Well, thank you very much, Judge. And uh, we, we might close here and thank you very much for your time and uh, enjoy Perth. And hopefully we'll be able to see you in Melbourne when, uh, when state border closures allow. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you.